I welcome you to this workshop, uh, Friends or Foes on Science and Christianity. My name is Stefan Gustafsson, and I'm the director of uh, Apologia, Center for Christian Apologetics. And we work with uh, training Christians in uh, apologetics, in explaining and defending the faith. And we do persuasive evangelism, evangelism uh, from an apologetic uh, perspective. And today we are going in this workshop to deal with one of the uh, most common objections we have to the Christian faith, the relationship between science and Christianity. There is a very common picture of the relationship between science and faith, science and God, science and Christianity. And that is that there is a tension, or even worse, a conflict, that historically it has been this struggle where God for a long time had the upper hand against science, but gradually science became stronger and stronger. And for the last one or two or three centuries, science is dominating. And actually, science has just knocked God out of the ring. So people imagine this kind of conflict. The 20th century most famous uh, atheist, at least for the first half of the um, 20th century, was Bertrand Russell, a philosopher from Oxford. He could say things like this, religion is something left over from the infancy of our intelligence. It will fade away as we adopt reason and science as our guidelines. So religion, includes, uh, including Christianity, belongs to the past and to the immaturity, the infancy of humankind, of intelligence, where we did not use our reason and we did not have access to science. But as soon as we start to use reason and we adopt the scientific method, religious will just fade away. Lawrence Krauss, one of the new atheists, so now we are in the 21st century. He's a, a world famous cosmologist and atheist. And he wrote this article in the uh, New Yorker with the title, all scientists should be militant atheists. So here you have it. If you take science seriously, you have to be an atheist. Now, if this is true, it, it's of course deeply problematic because you just have to love science. Science is a wonderful tool and we benefit all of us every second of our lives from the discoveries of science and how that is applied in modern technology and in medicine and so on. Science have radically changed uh, this, uh, the life for us on planet Earth. So if there is a conflict between science and the Christian faith, we are in deep trouble because you have to love science. So what can we say about this? This is of course a huge subject and I can just touch on a few issues, but let me, let me bring up three main points before we go over to uh, a Q&A for a discussion time. Let's first look at the history of science. Historically, what's the relationship between Christianity and science? Science have of course grown out from the university and the universities, they were started with their background in the monasteries. Monasteries have become study centers with libraries. They had disputations and debates on theological issues, philosophically, philosophical issues, and gradually on many, many other issues. And then out of the monasteries, the universities were started. Here is a very academic book on the history of the universities in Europe. And it says in, in the foreword, the university is a European institution. Indeed, it is the European institution par excellence uh, above others. It is a creation of medieval Europe, which was the Europe of papal Christianity. So the university is a European institution which grew out of Christianity in Europe. 
And this you can easily see if you study the individual universities. Uh, one of the oldest, the second oldest university in the world is Oxford University. Today, often viewed as the most prestigious of all universities in the world. Here is their shield and their motto. You can see it's an open book. And in the book it says, Dominus Illuminatio Mea, that's Latin. And that means the Lord is my light. It's a quote from Psalm 27. That was the view of the people who started Oxford University. Another very prestigious university is, is Harvard. Their motto is Veritas, but that is not the original motto. The original shield and motto looked like this. Still Veritas at the center, but now it's surrounded. Originally, it was surrounded by these words, Veritas, Christo et Ecclesia. That means truth for Christ and the church. Now we could have gone on and, and looked at the different universities. They have Christian roots. So historically, there's not a tension or a conflict between Christianity and science. On the contrary. So here is what the historians is saying. Most significantly, the Middle Ages laid a foundation for the greatest achievement of Western civilization, modern science. So the foundation for science was back in the Middle Ages, the Christian period. <clears throat> Rodney Stark who has written extensively about this. He says, like this, not only were science and religion compatible, they were inseparable. Christian theology was essential for the rise of science. So not only were they compatible, that you can have science and Christian theology side by side, the internal relationship was that Christian theology inspired science. What was it in the Christian faith that gave the impetus for science? Well, it was a number of biblical perspectives. People in Europe, they read on the first page of the Bible that man's vocation as created in the image of God was to subdue the earth. In order to subdue this creation, you need to understand it. You need to analyze it. So you need to use your mind and use your senses. So here's a calling to take control over this world. Of course, in a responsible way, before your creator. But here you have a calling to try to understand what kind of world God has created. In Europe, People read, when they read in the Bible, they saw that God is logos, the logical one. They expected a rational mind behind the universe. If God is logos, if he is a rational mind, then you can expect order, not chaos, in his creation. So from Christianity, you can expect a rational universe. And uh, people were not surprised by the findings of regularities, what we can formulate as natural laws. Most culture in the world have been polytheistic, many, many small, finite gods. And people have identified a specific god behind a certain phenomena in nature. So behind thunder here in the Nordic countries, people imagined Thor, the god Thor. And behind all the different uh, phenomena of nature, the sun, the moon, the stars, the sea, the wind, and so, so on, there were a specific god. But these gods were all fighting against each other. It was chaos beyond this scene. And therefore, in a polytheistic a context, you do not expect order. The Jewish, and of course then the Christian belief, is there is only one God, and he is sovereign. 
And therefore you can expect a universal order. You can expect coherence. Fourthly, out from the Bible, people knew that this world is created. It has not been here uh, from eternity and it is not here necessarily. God was free to create it whatever kind of world he wanted. And you could not just by imagination or by rational thought come to the conclusion what kind of world did God create. You need to go out and do investigation. You need to be empirical to see of all the possibilities that God had, which world did he choose to actualize, to make real? And this, of course, is an enormous impetus for science when it became empirical to do experiments. According to Christian theology, the universe is also created ad extra. That means outside of God. If you go to the pantheistic cultures, they merge the creator and creation. Everything becomes one. And this world can be seen as ultimately divine. If you have that kind of world, worldview, you do, do not do experiments with the divine. You meditate over it or you worship it. In many of the traditional uh, religions in Africa or Latin America, uh, they were animistic. They thought there were spirits, good and bad spirits in the ground, in the trees, uh, and so on. And you had to have respect. They were afraid for, of some um, aspects of nature. Out from Christianity, people knew that this world is not divine. The only thing you or the only one you should worship is, of course, God. So it's not dangerous to do experiments with this world. And there is not evil spirits in the ground um, who can curse you if you do something wrong with nature. So there's a number of examples of biblical perspective that freed up people to do science. To quote C.S. Lewis, men became scientific because they expected law in nature and they expected law in nature because they believed in a law giver. So here is underlining one of these aspects uh, of the regularity, the coherence, the order of nature, which follows naturally from the belief in a rational God, in a law giver. Modern science was launched by Christians or people who believed in a creator God. Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, uh, Newton, all the big names in uh, science from history, they believed in God, in a creator. They didn't see a conflict between their belief in a creator God and their enterprise as scientists. The father of the Big Bang Theory, uh, George Lemaitre, and we will return to him, uh, he was a priest. The leader of the uh, Human uh, Genome Project, all the information about the human DNA, Francis Collins, he is an evangelical Christian. So historically, there was not a tension, and that continues uh, 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 until today, that there are so many scientists, world-leading scientists, that are believers in God or are Christians. Now, of course, there have been isolated subjects and points in history with conflicts, real conflicts. We think, of course, naturally about Galileo Galilei and the whole discussion about a geocentric or a heliocentric world view. But notice, in that conflict, where, where you, ha you have to say that the church uh, in the end handled that conflict very badly, but you have to see that it was not a conflict between science and Christianity. They were Christians on all sides in that debate. Galileo was believed in God and was a Christian. 
So it was a debate amongst Christians on how to interpret the Bible. And it was a discussion among scientists, because not all of the contemporary scientists, uh, contemporary with Galileo, agreed with him. So it was a discussion among, where, where amongst Christians and within the scientific community. Now, of course, in the long run, uh, it was proved through uh, Newton that Galileo and uh, his theory was the right one. And uh, uh, the church uh, handled this, this, uh, this debate in the wrong, uh, in the wrong way. And there, if you study it historically, you will see that uh, it became a very personal thing be between the Pope and Galileo. But this is actually not a good example of a, uh, that it have been a, a conflict, uh, uh, a, a real conflict on the level of principles. Of course, you can also think of, of all the discussion, all the heated discussion uh, around um, Charles Darwin and his theory of, of evolution. But you should also notice that uh, already from the beginning, many Christians uh, accepted Charles Darwin's theory, and so no uh, real conflict between his theory of biological evolution and uh, uh, belief in God as a creator. Actually, Charles Darwin is buried in, uh, in Westminster Abbey uh, in London. Uh, so, and uh, is buried uh, inside the church. Of course, uh, there's a lot of question uh, we can discuss about Charles Darwin and his theory, and we can come back to that in, in, uh, uh, in the discussion. So, my first point is historically, uh, the history of science is not a history of conflict with the Christian faith. On the contrary, uh, Christianity uh, inspired science uh, and through the ideas within the Christian faith, uh, it laid uh, a foundation for the scientific work. Secondly, the limits of science. One problem we have today is that because of the success of science, people have started to have an, an overinflated view of science. It's often called scientism. And scientist means that you view science as the only reliable source for knowledge. Here is Axel Rosenberg. He can say, he's an atheistic philosopher, saying science as our exclusive guide to reality. The, <clears throat> the problem here is the word exclusive and reality, as if science is the only reliable guide to the full reality. And that is obviously false. Science is absolutely the best guide for knowledge about nature. But human life have so many more dimensions where we still can have real knowledge, but it does not come from science. I usually take the example, do you know your birthday? And most people would nod and say, yeah, sure. I celebrate it every year. How on earth do you know your birthday? That's not scientific knowledge. Science cannot tell what day you were born. How do you know it? You know it because your mother has told you and your father. That's very good source. Your mother was there. And you can read it in some historical sources who tells that on a certain day, in my case, a boy was born and he was, uh, he had this weight and, and length and, and so on. We can have knowledge about many areas, knowledge that does not come from science, but is still really good knowledge. Science is the best guide to knowledge about nature, but life is so much wider and bigger than nature. I like this tweet 
uh, from Randall Rouser. He says, the secularist who says that science is the ultimate measure of knowledge reminds me of the seven-year-old boy who thinks his dad knows everything. There's a certain charm in the child's devotion, but he's very naive nonetheless. And I think that goes for scientists as well. So I think we should view science as a wonderful but limited tool. Science can discover nature, but of course it cannot say anything about the supernatural. But we can still have knowledge about the supernatural, but from other sources. Philosophically, maybe through revelation. Science deals with physics, not with metaphysics. It can tell us things about the physical world, but all the metaphysical questions, science can answer them for us, but we can still have knowledge in those areas. I like this quote from Peter Krift. There's no scientific proof that only scientific proofs are good proofs. No way to prove by the scientific method that the scientific method is the only valid method. <clears throat> or here's another quote from G.K. Chesterton. Unfortunately, science is only splendid when it is science. When science becomes religion, it becomes superstition. And that is so true. The great philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, he has said this, the great delusion of modernity is that the laws of nature explain the universe for us. The laws of nature describe the universe. They describe the regularities, but they explain nothing. This is really important. The, dif the difference between describing and explaining. Science describes a lot of the processes in nature, but ultimately they cannot explain why nature is there or why the processes are what they are. They explain uh, nothing. So it's important to see that uh, there are different levels in our knowledge. And you can talk about different levels of explanation. Uh, in, in philosophy, this is a, a common uh, illustration. Here is a kettle with boiling water. Why is the water boiling? Well, you can explain it by saying, well, it looks like there is heat underneath it. And because of the heat, uh, the molecules start to move and the water starts to boil. That is a good explanation. That is a scientific explanation of why the water is boiling. But you can also give another kind of explanation saying, I want a cup of tea. That is equally true. It's not less true. It's just an explanation of another level. Already Thomas of Aquinas um, in the uh, 13th century differentiated between primary and secondary causes. Science deals with the secondary courses describing the processes in nature. God is the primary cause and the ultimate explanation for why nature is there and have the processes it have. <clears throat> and finally, before we move into a time of Q&A, the conversation with science. I think it's a, it's a good way to talk about a conversation between science and the Christian faith. We as Christians, we need to note it, notice that the Bible is not a scientific textbook. And I think too many Christians have a tendency to read the Bible as if it answers scientific questions. But actually, it does not. The purpose of the Bible is not to replace what we can do at the university in order to understand the processes of nature, not at all. I think that Galileo in his debate with the Pope uh, has a very good point. Because the, the, the church and the, the Pope, they claim that there were certain verses in the Bible that seems to indicate that the old model of the universe, that the earth is at the center, that that is the true model, so therefore the Bible, they said, seemed to teach that the earth is at the center. And uh, Galileo answered, the Holy Spirit's intention 
in giving us the Bible, inspiring the Bible, is to teach us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. That is a very good point. The intention of the Holy Spirit is not to give us the scientific facts about the universe. It is to teach us about who God is and how we can be reconnected to him through Jesus Christ. It is about salvation. I think we are wise as Christians if we make uh, the following distinction. There are certain things in the Christian faith that are non-negotiable, that you cannot have a Christian faith without them. One of those non-negotiables is that God created the universe. And for me, that is a closed fist. It's a hard fact. Uh, it's a non-negotiable that God created this universe. If you study the New Testament, creation is mentioned over 60 times directly or, or indirectly in the text. And every time this is emphasized, that God created the universe. If you take the question of how did he do it and when did he do it, I keep them in the open hand. I notice that the New Testament does not address them uh, anytime. It's absolutely silent on how and when. And I think we are wise uh, to make this difference between that God created the universe, which is an essential Christian belief, and that we keep the issue about how he did it and when he did it as an open an open question. And we know that uh, evangelicals, Bible-believing Christians, scholars are reading Genesis 1 in different ways. It's possible to understand and interpret uh, that text in several different ways. One interesting er <clears throat> area of dialogue between science and the Christian faith is the Big Bang Theory. Now, here's a lot of misunderstandings. I meet a, a often non-Christians saying, oh, I don't believe in God, I believe in the Big Bang. And I meet too many Christians who say, no, I don't believe in the Big Bang, I believe in God. So they put up a, a conflict, but I think they've misunderstood the situation. 100 years ago, Many of the scientists and many of the philosophers thought that the universe is eternal. Here's an example. Svante Arrhenius, a Swedish Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. He wrote 1903 this, the universe in its essence has always been what it is now. So the universe is eternal. It has never come into being. That position sits very well with atheism. So 100 years ago, the atheists said, well, you Christians, you say, God created the universe. If we then ask who created God, you say, well, no one. He's never come into being. He's just there. We have a much easier solution, the atheist said. Get rid of God. And then you can say about the universe all the things you are saying about God. It never came into being. It is eternal. It has always been there. It's just a brute fact. That view of the universe sits well with atheism. It's problematic in rela relationship to Christianity. Now, in the 1920s, things started to happen. Here is a photo of three uh, famous men, and you recognize um, Einstein to the, to the right. To the left is uh, uh, Robert Millikan, also a Nobel, Nobel Prize winner uh, in physics. And in the middle, you have Georges Lemaitre, who was a world leading uh, scientist. And he's the one who first proposed the ideas of the Big Bang. Now, he met a lot of opposition because people realized the implication if this is true. Lemaitre's model upset the millennia-old orthodoxy of an eternal, unchanging cosmos. It clearly implied that the universe must itself have had a birth at a finer time in the past. And gradually, during the 20th century, 
the theory of, of the Big Bang has been confirmed and is today uh, the generally accepted theory of the universe. Now, this sits very well with the Christian faith. This universe is not eternal. It has a beginning. It came into existence. It sits not well with atheism. Today, it's the atheists who are struggling to understand how can a universe just come into being? Already C.S. Lewis in the 1940s wrote this. In one respect, as many uh, Christians have noticed, contemporary science has recently come into line with Christian doctrine and parted company with the classical forms of materialism. If anything emerges clearly from modern physics, it is that nature is not everlasting. The universe had a beginning and will have an end. But the great materialistic systems of the past all believed in the eternity and thence in the self-existence of matter. As Professor, Professor Whitaker said in the Riddle Lectures of 1942, quote, it was never possible to oppose seriously the dogma of the creation, except by maintaining that the world has existed from all eternity in more or less its present state, end of quote. This fundamental ground for materialism has now been withdrawn. We should not lean too heavily on this for scientific theories change, but at the moment it appears that the burden of proofs rests not on us, but on those who deny, deny that nature has some cause beyond itself. And since, uh, since Lewis wrote this in 1943, the Big Bang Theory has been confirmed in, in several different ways. Another um, and closely related area uh, is uh, uh, the new information about the fine-tuning of the universe. That the universe seems to be fine-tuned for life in a most mind-blowing, amazing way. A huge number of factors uh, are, uh, are fine-tuned. Alvin Planting, a world-leading philosopher, he says, one reaction to these apparent enormous coincidences is to see them as substantiating the theistic claim that the universe has been created by a personal God. It is as if there are a large number of dials that have to be tuned to within extremely narrow limits for life to be possible in our universe. It is extremely unlikely that this should happen by chance, but much more likely that this should happen if there is such a person as God. The universe seems to, to indicate that there is a mind, an intelligence behind it. The fine tuning of the universe was the main argument that led Anthony Flew, one of the world famous atheists during the 20th century, to actually change his view and became a kind of theist. He acknowledged there must be a mind behind the universe because of the fine tuning of the universe, new information about the universe. Uh, 